This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the cyclist was solitary, the bachelor was noble, and the resident was patient, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? On which three continents did Watson have experience of women? When did 221B Baker Street first get telephone service? And why does Holmes prefer telegrams over writing? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 250, Financially Speaking. Hello there, and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you ready to speak financially, so to speak? I'm ready to get down to the money, the money. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to pull one of your arms and see all of the coins just come out of your mouth. <laughs> now, with me, you'd uh, pull the front of my jacket and then all the silverware would come down like it, <laughs> like it used to do from uh, Harpo. There you go. I'll turn you upside down and shake you. In the teapot. Um, yeah. yeah, Fantastic. Well, uh, the show notes for this episode are available at iHose.co slash trifles250. There you can find any links we have. We're going to have links to a number of previous episodes, including we'll probably put together a playlist for you to, uh, to hear because there are subjects here that are all uh, revolving around the same topic, episodes that revolve around the same topic. Um, of course, you can support us on Patreon. We are uh, on Patreon at patreon.com slash trifles, or just go to sherlockholmespodcast.com in the show notes, and you'll see it there. And of course, we encourage you to email us if you have any suggestions or feedback or anything else uh, as we wind down uh, the fourth quarter here as uh, we round on the bend into 2022 and think about season six. You can email us at trifles that I hear of Sherlock.com. All right. We said we'd be speaking financially. And, um, well, we've, we've covered, as, as I mentioned in the intro there, we've covered financial elements in some other episodes. We looked first at the fiscal homes, or Numi in Arca. Uh, that was uh, an early uh, Sherlockian expose by, I think, Robert Keith Levitt, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then we looked at old money, you know, how, how we think about uh, shillings, bobs, crowns, guineas, pounds, etc., in episode 121. Uh, we looked at spare no expense in episode 201, all the expenses and the administrative side of Holmes' work that he uh, came across. And most recently, we looked at money woes in episode uh, 226, I guess looking at uh, some financial difficulties that uh, some people had. And Bert, you, you surfaced this, uh, this topic of uh, just talking about financial uh, items in our show planning, and I thought, well, what a great opportunity for you to take the reins here and lead us down the money trail. The money trail, and this was explored beautifully in a book called Sherlock Holmes Detected by Ian McQueen, which dates back to the 1970s, where he wrote a rather large section on financial matters, and it's a great guidepost to this sort of discussion. And we know almost from the beginning, for example, that scene with Holmes and the king of Bohemia in a scandal in Bohemia, that uh, money is on his mind. He says to the king then, as to money, but he was not always businesslike or even consistent in his financial affairs. He says in The Noble Bachelor, the status of my client is a matter of less moment to me than the interest of his case. In Study in Scarlet, as we've observed before, he says about his early clients, I listen to their story, they listen to my comments, and then I pocket my fee. 
And of course, famously in Thor Bridge, he says, my professional charges are upon a fixed scale. I do not vary them, save when I remit them altogether. So uh, this is this is interesting to me because Holmes seems to to go in and out of his concern with money. And I, I have to think it depends on the client or the clientele that he has. You know, he he was also in front of the Duke of Holderness and said, I am a poor man. <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Well, next to the Duke, everyone's poor. Um, but but kind of putting up this this uh, pseudo fight in front of uh, Neil Gibson, the gold king, that he doesn't vary his charges except when he re- remits them all together. Um, or, or saying the, the status of my client is is of less the moment in the noble bachelor. I mean, it's this 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 lady doth protest too much, uh, methinks, of uh, of homes and money matters. E- either that, or he's flush at these times, and he really doesn't care. <laughs> well, yeah, I think his 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 experience with money obviously has its ups and downs. You know, there's clearly a cycle, and we've observed before. There's this scene in Final Problem where he tells Watson. Basically, you know, if not for Moriarty at this point in my career, I am you know, ready to pack it all in and retire and just work on my own studies. So clearly he was very well off by that point. But his income lies at the very root of his reputation and his fame because it was only due to a shortage of money that Watson was introduced to Holmes as a fellow lodger. Yes. And and we know that that um Holmes was not accustomed to a rich lifestyle. He was not extravagant. He begins doesn't he smokes a lot, but he doesn't spend a lot on tobacco. He begins the day by smoking the leavings from the day before. <laughs> he he likes to go to concerts and likes music. Art is interesting to him, but he doesn't seem to have any great paintings. Uh, he doesn't eat much. He doesn't he likes to dine out occasionally, but his normal diet is very minimal. His only extravagance was sending telegrams. Well, you know, I mean, they, they don't talk about this too much, but a uh, a bad cocaine habit will eat up your funds pretty quickly. <laughs> Not in eighteen ninety five. It would. You just I go know. down to the chemist and <laughs> get a bucket. Of, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mr. Holmes, uh, another bucket of cocaine. Sloshing his way back, back to Baker Street. I no. like that. No, but you're, you're right. I mean, this was this was an over-the-counter thing. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, paying extravagant sums to a dealer on the on, on the street corner or anything, or the, the back alley. No. So. But in the early days, you know, clearly clients were very few. Money was short. But, you know, within the next 10 years, his payments, as an example, to Mrs. Hudson become princely. Watson tells us in The Dying Detective, I've no doubt the house might have been purchased at the price which Holmes paid for his rooms during the years I was with him. Hmm. And so, you know, that gets us to sort of, well, what exactly did Holmes earn in the early days of his career? Well, in Study in Scarlet, Watson tells us that his income, Watson's income was only 11 shillings and six a day or about four pounds a week. And if Holmes had had an income of, say, six pounds or more a week, he would not have needed to share uh, the cost of the lodging with anyone. So therefore, his earnings, if Watson made four pounds a week, his earnings at the time of Study in Scarlet were somewhere around four pounds, six pounds a week. And, you know, during his career, he did a lot of work without thought of a fee. So clearly money wasn't coming in the door. Hmm. In in Black Peter, even Watson says he would devote weeks of the most intense application to the affairs of some humble client whose case presented those strange and dramatic qualities which appealed to his imagination and challenged his ingenuity. Yeah, and... and in addition to uh, the pro bono work for uh, humble clients like that, there were other cases where Holmes is just stepping in as a consultant to the police. And and I don't think there's ever uh, a mention of the police actually hiring him. And they, they, they go to him for pointers, for tips, but there's no indication that there's a contract in place or that there is some, uh, you know, Inspector Lestrade slush fund uh, for paying homes on the side. Uh, but you look at what happened in um, 
oh gosh, Black Peter and the Rygate Squires and the Six Napoleons uh, and, and probably about six or seven other uh, uh, cases of, of that sort. You know, Holmes, Holmes was simply a, a, a good helper to the police. Yeah, the very first case, study in Scarlet. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nothing. And not only not only was there no slush fund for Lestrade or anyone to pay him, they came to Baker Street and smoked his cigars and drank his whiskey. That's true. That's I mean, he could have <laughs> billed them back for it if he wanted to. Well, and and that leads me to think about well, what about the cases Watson did not report? You know, if there were some wealthy clients that Holmes had. Look, maybe he wasn't able to solve some of these cases. He does tell us that there are four cases where he's been defeated three times by a man and once by a woman. Um, but what does Holmes do in an unsuccessful case? I mean, he must still charge for the effort he put in. And, and in some of those unpublished cases, perhaps there were some wealthy clients that floated Holmes throughout the uh, the time that allowed him to take on these nine or ten cases uh, in the canon where he wasn't paid by the police. Well, that's true. That's certainly a possibility. And, you know, there are other things that go on. So, for example, in The Five Orange Pips and The Dancing Men, <laughs> unfortunately, his clients, who were the only ones who were in a position to pay him, are murdered <laughs> after engaging him to protect them. <laughs> that's so, true. I must so, demand upfront payment after this. <laughs> yes, and in the retired colorman, you know, spoiler alert, the client himself was the murderer. So Now, see, um, that must have been one of the dumbest cases <laughs> of a guy going, well, I, I'll throw the police off my set. I'll go to Sherlock Holmes. And knowing he's the murderer, <laughs> he goes to the smarter detective. Yeah. I mean, boy, oh, boy, the hubris. Yeah. And then missing three quarter, you know, Holmes didn't get anything in the missing three quarter. And then the Greek interpreter and the engineer's thumb. Uh, huh. Poor old Mr. Melos and poor old Thumbless Hatherly uh, <laughs> would not have expected to get an invoice from Sherlock Boy, Holmes. Boy, you know, and... Hatherly must have had a really tough time hitchhiking home after that case. You <laughs> 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 should only go down one-way streets, I guess. Right. Oh. But, yeah, the, the, you think about some of the other cases. Uh, there, there weren't any fees in. Uh, the Gloria Scott, right? that's where he got his start. Uh, he got a nice weekend for it, but, again, he was recuperating from a, a medical injury there. Um, the Devil's Foot, I mean, he was on holiday, and, uh, yep. and the, the vicar asked him to step in. Um, the Lion's Mane, you know, just, uh, just strolling the coast, and there's a jellyfish murder. I mean, hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then in the Red Circle and the Veiled Lodger, Holmes is consulted by landladies, and it's not clear that any remuneration came to Holmes as a result of that work. Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, let's get back to this after we pay some bills ourselves here with this quick word from our sponsor. You know, it's all well and good to have a subscription to the Baker Street Journal. In fact, the most recent issue just recently came out and is making its way to mailboxes all over the world. But when you're looking for scholarship past rather than present, the easiest way to go about finding that is with the EBSJ. The EBSJ is a PDF archive that provides a complete set of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 all the way through 2011 on a single DVD in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages spanning the old series, the Christmas annuals, and the new series all the way through 2011. Will there be another EBSJ to update us in the last decade? Well, we certainly hope so. What format will it take? Well, that's up to you to find out. But get the EBSJ version 2 on DVD while it's still around. Find it online at BakerStreetIrregulars.com. All right, we are back, and we're talking about money in the Sherlock Holmes stories, financial, financially speaking. Uh, I should mention that uh, Chris Redmond has had a series of articles he's written on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. The most recent 
is called Thinking About Money in the Sherlock Holmes stories. How appropriate. Uh, oh. There's links of uh, some other uh, items in there, like canonical currency in present-day terms, uh, the curious incident of the guinea coin, and others. So we'll have a link to, uh, to that uh, article in the show notes. So stay tuned. Very good. Well, they're, you know, rounding out this sort of survey, there were clearly cases in which Holmes made large amounts of money. There's very, every reason to believe early on the case of the Musgrave ritual. Reginald Musgrave, Musgrave, after all, could afford it. And Holmes, after all, had recovered the ancient crown of the kings of England, which Musgrave then arranged through, uh, you know, some huge sum to retain possession of. And then in Speckled Band, we hear about Mrs. Farintosh. And in fact, her case, which concerned an opal tiara, uh, was her recommendation that prompted Helen Stoner to seek out Sherlock Holmes in the first place. And then in The Yellow Face, Grant Monroe was a client who, one of the earliest observations we hear about Grant Monroe is he had no need to practice economy. Oh, boy. (laughs) <laughs> There's an opportunity. I was badly in need of a case, Holmes confesses to Watson. And he was likely in need of a fee as well. And then Lady Brackenstall and Abby Grange, and of course the illustrious client, these people could well afford Holmes' fee. And Holmes, after all, offered Milverton 2,000 pounds for the return of the letters. So he was clearly well compensated as part of the Milverton affair. And by the by the middle of the 1880s, Certainly by the 1890s, Holmes' reputation was international, and the king of Scandinavia, the French Republic, would place their affairs in his hands. And to your point earlier about the unreported cases, the mission for the reigning family of Holland, the summons to Odessa for the Trepoff murder, the question of the Netherlands Sumatra Company, you know, these are probably paid very well. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, between uh, royal families and, uh, you know, large enterprises like that, Holmes could have uh, really uh, cashed in on his reputation, so to speak. Yeah. And then the later cases, you know, we know about the case of the papers of ex-president Murillo. Sounds like there's money there. The Smith Mortimer succession case. The sudden death of Cardinal Tosca is clearly Mm. money from his holiness. And we hear about, uh, in Solitary Cyclist, when Holmes first hears about Violet Smith, we know that he's involved in the persecution to which John Vincent Hardin, the well-known tobacco millionaire, had been subjected. And millionaire, well, there's a dead giveaway. I mean, there's (laughs) got to be money in there for him. Yeah, I mean, boy, talk about the opportunity to uh, write yourself a blank check in some of these cases. Uh, Holmes Holmes was probably doing just fine at that point. Oh. And then we, we talked in the last episode, in the Three Gables, about um, the 5,000 pounds that Holmes extracted from Isadora Klein, ostensibly going to Mary Maberly. Uh, we have no evidence that it happened. Uh, we have no evidence that it didn't happen, but uh, we know she was interested in travel. Um, Holmes clearly was not acting as a travel agent, uh, in that, as he uh, actually asked uh, Isadora Klein for an estimate of what it would cost to go around the world uh, at the time. So who knows how much of that made it to Mrs. Maberly. Hmm. Right. And uh, there are a lot of these references to cases of national importance and, and big sums of money and like the 5000 for Mrs. Maberly. There's a reference in the Blanche Soldier about Holmes' commission from the Sultan of Turkey, hmm. which called for immediate action. And then, of course... There's the 12,000 pounds, 6,000 pounds, 12,000 pounds from the Duke of Holderness. Well, what do you think that was? I mean, that's always been up for debate. Was it a 6,000 pound check or was it a 12,000 pound check? Well, I like to think about the larger number. But, you know, the, the real question there is the disparity between Holmes' remark, the lack of consistency between Holmes' remark at that time, I am a poor man to his statement to Watson at the beginning of the final problem in which he's clearly well off enough to consider retiring. You know, what happened in those intervening years? Were there bad investments, outlays of cash we don't know anything about? Uh, But clearly, Holmes, by the time the case of the Duke of Holderness comes around, um, could use the money. And I 
prefer to think that the Duke, which who could afford it, he was not getting his shoes resold, uh, <laughs> as other characters have. Uh, I think he would pay twelve thousand pounds quite willingly to Sherlock Holmes. Yes, yeah. no, I I agree, and I I tend to think that the the whole I'm a poor man that Holmes said that tongue in cheek. I think he was extremely well off, but again, anyone compared to the Duke of Holderness would be poor. So Holmes was uh, had an opportunity to play it up and uh, perhaps uh, ensure that it was a twelve thousand pound check rather than a six thousand pound check. And did he split that with Watson? Oh, that's a good question. And well, you know, they started their relationship by sharing costs. I mean, if I were. Sherlock Holmes, I would think it only right and proper, particularly since I owe my fame and reputation to the work of this man. Well, but, um, the question be... on the other side is Watson never talks about his uh, expenses or his his income from writing for the Strand magazine. Did he share any of his royalties with Holmes? Well, there's also the literary agent, you know, clearly. Now, yeah, he was taking his cut, right? That wasn't 10 percent. There was probably more. Because he was very involved in spiritualism, and that costs money. That that is true, and and think of how he had to go back to Watson when he was in need of money, and cajole Watson to write more stories. <laughs> uh, it's true, you know. Well, and Holmes, you know, to sum it all up, Holmes' greatest satisfaction must have been the day when the premier itself himself comes to Holmes's little college his humble roof in his last bow to ensure that he becomes engaged in the Von Bork affair. And at the end of that case, Holmes is still, after all these years, still eager to get his hands on money. Because after all, he's had two years of work, and now there's a check in his hand. You know, they've bundled bon Von Bork into the car, and they're going back to London. And he has a check in his hand from Von Bork for 500 pounds. And Holmes says to Watson, I have a check for 500 pounds, which should be cashed early, for the drawer is quite capable of stopping it if he can. Interesting. Yeah. But that is only a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Name your figure. My professional charges are at a fixed rate. I do not vary them, save when I remit them altogether.